Hello, my name is Thomas Green. I'm a member of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. Thank you for your interest in the history of the indigenous Massachusetts nation. The purpose of this presentation is to inform the audience that the enduring Massachusetts tribe were and still are here, despite a long history of attempted erasure. I will touch upon many interesting and some less known topics spanning the time between the early 1600s leading up to the present. The word Massachusetts is derived from the local indigenous Massachusetts language. It is a three word description of the surrounding topography. Massa translates to big, large, or great. Wachu translates to hill or mound. Set translates to place. These three words put together describe place of the great hill or Massa Wachusett. The Massachusetts are the tribe of indigenous peoples from who the colony and the Commonwealth have taken their name. The current day Massachusetts tribe has taken its name back from the Commonwealth, as it is said and spelled today. In order for people to understand the correlation between the once mighty indigenous tribal nation of the Massachusetts and the name that the Commonwealth appropriated from them. The current seal for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts displays a local indigenous man with an arrow in his left hand pointing down in submission. It also displays the colonial arm and broadsword of Miles Standish placed strategically above the Massachusetts man, symbolically oppressing him into submission. The current day Massachusetts tribe has modified the seal of the Commonwealth as an action of taking back our autonomy and sovereignty. With the indigenous Massachusetts man having his arrow pointing up, ready to defend his people and territory. We have removed the oppressive arm of Miles Standish, brandishing the broadsword. We have added the symbolism and sacred medicine of the three sisters corn, beans, and squash, which were agricultural staples in the indigenous Massachusetts diet. We have also added the hills for which we are named. The sun indicates that we are people of the first light. We have also invoked the spirit of the hawk. Hawks were traditionally trained by the indigenous Massachusetts to assist in hunting, in retrieving of small game. Next, I'd like to talk about pre-colonial interaction. European sailors were sailing the east coast of what is now Canada and the United States as early as the late 1400s. They would come ashore to resupply and trade with the indigenous peoples, sometimes absconding bodily with the actual indigenous peoples. Some of the kidnapped youth were sold into slavery. Other reasons that indigenous people were kidnapped was to deliver them to European kings and queens. Young men who were kidnapped and brought to England would be first taught English and then interrogated about their homeland. Who were their chieftains? Who held the power? How was power passed? How large were their territories? How many men were there? How did they deal with territorial conflicts? Who would ally with who when their harbors were threatened? What did they eat? How did they live? Was it in large communities or small villages? What was the social order? What did they worship? 
The English wanted to know everything they possibly could about the indigenous people of the New World. In southeastern New England, the English estimated 287 indigenous persons per square mile in 1600. Why the body count? It would seem as though the English might be preparing an invasion. French exploratory and trading parties sought furs in alliance with the Massachusetts. A tale passed down from generations explains that in the early 1600s, Frenchmen sought an alliance with the Massachusetts. They wanted us to hunt and trap for furs to trade with them exclusively. Although the Massachusetts traded with the Europeans and continued to do so, they would not enter into an alliance of exclusive trade with the French. The French sought alliance further north and ultimately ended up allying with the Abenaki. This alliance was mutually agreeable as the Abenaki endured a colder climate not as favorable for farming and happened to hunt and trap more. This alliance also afforded the Abenaki access to French arms. <laughs> the way the story is told about the French by the elders and passed down to us is, after the French entered into an alliance <laughs> with the Abenaki, they tried again to ally with the Massachusetts. A party of French traders gifted a finely tailored French coat to the Grand Sachem. The Sachem could not accept the coat, knowing of the alliance the French had with the Abenaki. As not to be rude to their guests, the Sachem tried on the coat, after which he declared that it did not fit. He passed the coat to his sagamore, who tried the coat and also said it did not fit him either. The coat was passed down the hierarchy of Massachusetts, who each in their turn tried the coat and said it did not fit, until the coat was handed to a man with no status or authority at all. This man accepted the coat happily. Since the coat was not accepted by anyone of status or power, the gift and offer of alliance was meaningless. I'd like to take a minute to explain the hierarchy in which sachem ships operated. There were families of the blood, meaning of a particular bloodline that dominated most Northeast woodland indigenous sachem ships. Upon the death of one sachem, another family member, usually the offspring of the deceased sachem, would be his or her successor. These sachems would delegate power, land, and responsibility to sagamores or war chiefs. Or alternatively, sometimes take on the role of Sagamore themselves. Sagamores would in turn delegate power, land, and responsibilities to lesser or petty sachems. Petty or lesser sachems would usually be a matriarch or patriarch from one or sometimes more family clans or family bands. On par with sachems were powwows, which were medicine men, or powusks, which would have been a medicine woman. A sachem or sagamore might also fit this role. Powwows and powusks were venerated by most indigenous and considered to have very powerful medicine. They would have also been considered the spiritual leaders of the people. Shown here are the current traditional leadership of the Massachusetts tribe. Sachem Feather on the Moon, Tawusk Nanawieta Wren, and our Sagamore Strong Medicine. 
Next, I would like to talk about the Pawtuckets, the ruling band of the Massachusetts Northern Territories. Just prior to English colonization, Nenepeshamit was the hereditary grand sachem of the Northern Territories of the Massachusetts Tribal Nation. His sachemship, a people and or area under the direct influence of a sachem, was of the most numerous, most powerful, and most prestigious band, whom the other bands chose to lead them all, the Massachusetts. According to French explorer Samuel de Champlain, the Massachusetts were in an age-old war with the Abenaki to the north. Nanapeshamit, the grand sachem of the northern Massachusetts, had been claiming victory and territory from the Abenaki for quite some time. The Abenaki did ally with the French and eventually procured French firearms. After successfully trading with the Europeans for over 100 years without contracting major illnesses, the Massachusetts were infected with a great plague thought to be smallpox brought by English traders in 1616. This plague decimated the numbers of the Massachusetts as well as throwing their villages into chaos and drastically reducing their fighting forces. It was said that the plague killed up to 90% of the Massachusetts nation. In 1619, emboldened by the plague that had decimated overwhelming numbers of fighting Massachusetts, the Abenaki, having acquired firearms from the French, did do battle with, defeat, and kill Grand Sachem Nenepeshamit. Another powerful indigenous leader would have been Webkowitz, Nenepeshamit's most trusted advisor and powwow to the Pawtucket Band of Massachusetts. Again, a powwow is a medicine man and a powwus is a medicine woman. Webkowitz married Nenepeshamit's wife after his death in 1619. Next in the hierarchy of Pawtucket leadership would have been a Sagamore or war chief. Maskanamit would have been a Sagamore. Nenepeshamit had several Sagamores to rally and lead warriors when necessary. Petty or lesser sachems would have been the leader of a band of one or more families. Pexuit was a petty sachem of Wessagusset, which is now known as Wayman. Established family bands would have a council of elders to advise their sachem. After the death of Nenepeshamit in 1619, leadership of the Pawtucket went to his wife, the squaw sachem. The squaw sachem held the role of sachem as her sons were still children. After the death of her husband, she came under threat of losing her sachemship to neighboring bands. She agreed to an accord of mutual assistance and protection with Puritan governor John Winthrop. Under this accord, she agreed to allow the occupancy of some of her lands by the Puritans. Governor Winthrop presented Squaw Sachem with a finely tailored English coat to solidify the accord. Winthrop also ensured that such a coat was given to the Squaw Sachem as tribute each following year. She raised three sons who inherited the right to rule their own territories. Squaw Sachem spent her last days in the Massachusetts praying town of Natick. The sons 
one of Hakwaham, or Sagamore John of Winnisimet, lived from 1608 to 1633. Montawapate, or Sagamore James of Saugus, lived from 1609 to 1633. In Montawapet, married Win Winuchis, daughter of Pistanaway, the sachem of the Penacook. This union solidified an alliance between the Pawtucket and the Penacook. Sadly, both older sons died during the smallpox epidemic of 1633. Then we have Winnipoikin or Sagamore George of Namkeek. He lived from 1616 to 1684. He survived the smallpox epidemic, but suffered a facial deformity and was called No Nose George, according to some accounts. Sagamore George or Winnipoikin continued to lead the Pawtucket until his death in 1684 at the Massachusetts praying town of Natick. In 1614, English explorer John Smith sailed the eastern coast of North America from Cape Ann to Cape Cod. He made note of the vast planting fields that stretched for miles along the coast, the abundance of natural resources, in the abundance of indigenous people. He proclaimed the Massachusetts enjoyed the paradise of all these pots. This is true. Nature was very good to the Massachusetts. Corn, beans, and squash, known as the three sisters, were, the, were vegetables planted each spring in the planting fields owned by the women. The women of the tribe also gathered fruits, berries, tree nuts, grapes, wild rice, various wild roots, and herbs. Of the sea, they gathered seaweeds, shellfish like clams, lobster, and fished for small fish using nets made from fibrous plants and with the erection of fish wares to corral the fish. They trapped small game and prepared and preserved the harvest. The women sewed all the clothing and wove their baskets and mats used in their homes. In their spare time, some made jewelry of bone, stone, and shell. The women of the village built and owned the summer dwellings down by the sea called Weetus. They disassembled them each fall and carried them with them to their winter quarters. There they had built inland winter dwellings called longhouses. Women generally chose their own partners unless it was a political marriage to seal an alliance. The women of the tribe controlled most of what went on in everyday life of the village, but both men and women were involved in the leadership of the tribe. Men of the tribe performed deep sea fishing and whaling. They hunted plentiful large game, quarried for stone, and designed weapons of war and tools for fishing, whaling, hunting, and trade. Younger men would likely be counted among the fighting force that defended their villages and territory. Older men and children might help tend the planting fields and help with river and lake fishing and collecting shellfish. Next, I'm going to talk about the Nepontids, the ruling band of the Southern Massachusetts. It is written that Thomas Hunt a lieutenant of Captain John Smith kidnapped indigenous peoples unbeknownst to Captain Smith. I find it highly unlikely 
a ship's captain knows not the content of his ship's hull. One of these indigenous people was named Tisquantum, also known as Squanto. After traveling extensively for many years with Captain Smith, the captain returned to the Massachusetts coast. Tisquantum made it back to his home village of Patuxent, now called Plymouth, while his captain continued to travel down the coast. Sadly, Squanto found his home village deserted. His people either fled or were killed by the recent plague. Sometime after arriving home, other indigenous passing through brought him the news that his captain had been captured by Osamequin, also known as Massasoit. Squanto traveled to Montop, or what is now Mount Hope, in Rhode Island, to the home of Osamequin, also known as Massasoit, to see what was wrong and why his captain had been kidnapped. Squanto was also captured and held prisoner by Osamequin. Massasoit was said to have held Squanto against his will to act as his translator. Kinsman Tananapashamit was the grand sachem of the Southern Massachusetts, Chickatabit. Chickatabit was sachem of the Neponset. His sachemship stretched from the Charles River to the Patuxet, or what is now Plymouth, and to the west as far as what is now Worcester. He was one of those sachems said to have signed a treaty with Plymouth colonists in 1621. He was also said to be one out of all the sachems who disliked the English the most. That being said, the plagues had largely diminished his fighting force. With his sachemship threatened from the Abenaki to the north, Mohawks to the west, and the intrusion of Poconocet sachem Osamequin also known as Massasoit, to the south, Chickatalbit was also compelled to reach an accord of mutual protection and assistance with Governor John Winthrop of the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Through this accord, a friendship was formed between Chickatalbit and John Winthrop. It is said that Chickatalbit took dinner with Governor Winthrop at least once every few months enjoying a pipe afterwards, and even trying on some of the governor's colonial garb, which he thoroughly enjoyed. John Winthrop had an entire English suit of clothes made for Chickatawbit and gifted him a new English coat in silver every year as tribute. Although he tolerated the presence of the English in his territory, he never surrendered any of his territory to the English or signed any deeds that would alienate him from his land. Um, I just like to make a note here that Northeast Woodland indigenous leadership possessed and wore wampum peg as a sign of power and authority. The amount of wampum peg an indigenous leader possessed directly correlated with the status in the indigenous community. Wampum peg, as seen here, is a white and or purple bead crafted from the shell of a quahog. The indigenous leader may have initially believed that if worn, the elegantly tailored clothing of the English leadership would somehow imbibe him with the same authority among the English as wampum peg imbibed him with among the indigenous community. When the great plague of 1616 arrived and people began dying at his seat in Passanagisset, which is now Quincy, Chickatawbit moved his seat from Passanagisset to the area known today as Maswatusset Hummock, also in the area of Quincy. 
it was rumored that Osamequin, also known as Massasoit, or one of his subordinates, informed Plymouth colonist Edward Winslow that Chickatawbit was conspiring with other indigenous tribes to forcefully remove English at Wessagusset, or what is now known as Weymouth, and Patuxet, which is now known as Plymouth. In response, Plymouth colonists sent Miles Standish to Wessagusset to keep the peace with the Indians. Standish used this opportunity to invite Wittawama, a Massachusetts Sagamore, Hexuit, who was a local sachem, and one or two other indigenous leaders to peace talks. It is surmised that once inside, the Massachusetts delegation was offered poisoned food and or drink. Once incapacitated, they were murdered and beheaded. It is referred to as the West Augusta Massacre of 1623. This ruined relations and trade between the Massachusetts and English for years to come. However, Chickatawbit's authority or domain over Massachusetts territory was never challenged in his lifetime or the lifetime of his son, Wampatuck. Chickatawbit died of smallpox in 1633, Masotusikumik. His brother, Kichamakin, was regarded as Grand Sachem in the interim of, his, of Chickatawbit's son, Wampatuck, coming of age. After Chickatawbit's death, Kichamakin traveled to Titikid, which is now the Middleborough, Taunton, Raynham area, also parts of Bridgewater, to retrieve Wampatuck and bring him to his seat at Naponset, where he would be safe until he became of age. Wampatuck was raised and taught the Christian ways while living at the seat of Kichamakin. He learned to speak English and study the Bible. However, once he reached his majority, he totally and wholeheartedly rejects Christianity and the Puritan way of life. Taking up the reins of leadership in his late father's sachemship, he was known to constantly traverse his sachemship from village to village, checking on and ensuring the welfare of those indigenous within his sachemship. Due to his upbringing with integrated English ways, Wampatuck had a better understanding of English land ownership concept. He was responsible for conveying many areas of his sachemship to the English. He repeatedly requested a deed for the 6,000 acres of Ponkapog from the Dorchester proprietors to be made in his name and that of his council. It was voted on and decided by the Dorchester proprietors to allot the Indians at Ponkapog 6,000 acres. An actual deed was never given. In 1669, Wampatuck led a war party of Massachusetts, Narragansett, Pequot, and Mohican warriors into Mohawk territory in retaliation for the constant raids on Massachusetts planting fields. After a failed attack on the Mohawk, Wampatuck was returning home with the remainder of his war party when they were ambushed and he was killed. Wampatuck's brother Squamock also known as Daniel Chickatawbit, led the Massachusetts in the interim of Wampatuck's son, Charles Chickatawbit, becoming of age. Squamock was also said to have settled the long-standing quarrel between his late brother Wampatuck and Poconoket Sachem Medicom, the son of Osamequin or Massasoit, in regards to the bound boundary between their sachemships. Josias Wampatuck had three children, Charles, Jeremy, and Abigail. Charles Josias, also known as Charles Chickatawbit, 
was the next in the succession of Massachusetts bloodline sachems. Charles was asked by the colonists to sign many confirmatory deeds, meaning deeds confirming previous land conveyances by his father, Josias Wampatuck. He was led to believe that his grandfather, Chickatalbid, had agreed to the sale of Totant, or what is now known as Boston. Being misled, he unwittingly signed a confirmatory deed for what is now the city of Boston. However, as I previously stated, Chickatalbid only agreed to the occupancy of, not sale, of the area at that time being called Taunton, now called Boston. When Charles died around 1693, his sister Abigail assumed leadership of the Massachusetts at Ponkapog. I'm going to speak now uh, about Indian praying towns. Initially, 14 Indian praying towns were established. Natick, Ponkapog, Hassan Namesit, Chab Anagung Amug, Manexit, Munchug, Magunkaquag, Mashona, Okamakamasit, Pakachog, Wayontog, Quinetasit, Wabquasit, and Wamasit. Only four praying towns remain in 1677 after King Philip's War. Ponkapog was officially established in 1657 when the provincial government, also known as Dorchester Proprietors, voted on an area not to exceed 6,000 acres to be allotted to the Indians at Ponkapog. In 1658, the provincial government appointed guardians to protect the interest of the Indians gathering at Ponkapog. 1667, Josias Wampatuck, then sachem of the Massachusetts tribe, requests from Dorchester that a deed for 6,000 acres be made out to his council, including Squamog, Ohatan, Momentog, William Ahatan, Asarvusk, and Old Chiniquin. Shortly after that, it was deemed advisable to place all the men of the tribe under the command of quartermaster Thomas Swift of Milton, who removed them first to Long Island in Boston Harbor, then to Brush Hill in Milton where they were said to have raised some little corn, although late in the season, when they came from the harbor. And while there, they were visited every fortnight by John Elliott and Major, Gu and Major Daniel Gookin. A few years afterwards, the Indians were ordered to repair to their plantations at Punkapog and dwell there and a person was appointed to call over the names of the men and women every morning and evening. It was written that in 1668, Major Daniel Gookin held a court at Pakamit, also known as Ponkapog. Undoubtedly, his description of the place was written a year or two later. He calls it the second praying town, Elliot, in his description, says Ponkapog, also known as Pakinit, is our second town, where the sachems of the blood, as they term their chief royal line, have their residence. In 1676, the community at Ponkapog, although not a part of the King Philip's War, was removed once again to Deer Island in Boston Harbor. In 1687, an estimated half of the Ponkapog Reservation was lost to Ebenezer Billings. Large portions of the remainder obtained were obtained by others through leases 
with the guardians appointed for the Indians at Tonkapog. By order of the general court, leases at Tonkapog were reviewed in 1704. There's still being no actual plan or deed for the 6,000 acres awarded to the Indians from within what was their Aboriginal territory. In 1725, the general court ordered a survey of the lands belonging to the Ponkapog Indians. In 1756, Robert Spur, then a Ponkapog guardian, requests leave of the general court to survey the lands belonging to the Ponkapog. In 1760, a plan of the Ponkapog lands is finally approved, giving to the Indians some 710 acres of their original grant. All their other lands having been alienated in less than a century under the care of appointed guardians. From 1760 to 1857, Ponkapog land is misappropriated by guardians despite many petitions submitted to rectify the continuing trend. In 1857, Ponkapog guardians claim the Ponkapog tribe of Indians is nearly extinct. In 1860, John Milton Earl undertakes a census of the Ponkapog descendants as part of a statewide census of Indians. In 1869, uh, Massachusetts passes an act, of in, uh, an act of enfranchisement, making all Indian citizens and terminating Indian tribes. With this Indian Enfranchisement Act, what sovereign tribal lands were left were divided amongst the families that remained at Ponkapog. They were given deeds for said land, and with the deeds, the ability to sell what, what was held as communal tribal lands. Through the descendants of the indigenous Massachusetts that originally gathered at Ponkapog, the enduring Massachusetts remained, continuing age-old traditions and the stewardship of their ancestral homeland. Thank you very much for joining me today to learn about the history of the Massachusetts tribe. Please don't let your journey to learn about the Massachusetts tribe end here. Feel free to research and find new hidden gems of information on your own. Thank you again and have a great day.